This is the Balanced Advisor Podcast with Dr. Travis Perry, helping financial advisors like you achieve balance in their lives. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Balanced Advisor Podcast. I'm joined here by another amazing guest, Mr. Adam Holt. Adam, thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Travis. So real quickly, Adam has been a financial advisor for the last 23 years, during which time he has helped build and manage his wealth management firm to over $1 billion in assets under management. Adam is known for his early adoption of technology to build trend-setting client experiences. The mindset led him to found Asset Map, which we'll get to talk to a little bit more about today. A fintech firm dedicated to creating engaging visual communication tools used throughout the customer and advisor journey. Again, thanks for making the time to be on the podcast today, Mr. Adam Holt. No, I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Dr. Travis, uh, for having me and uh, and the community, for taking the time to listen to us banter about. So that's always special. Thank you for that time. You're welcome. We could underline banter and, you know, put it in italics. That's exactly what this is, but it's fun, productive banter nonetheless. Truly. So I appreciate that. Well, tell me a little bit about how you got started down this route, because obviously you're very successful in your own firm, and then you made this switch over. You know, we'll talk about Asset Map later, but tell us kind of how you got into into the firm to begin with. So, getting into financial services uh, was an interesting thing. You're right. For most of us that have gotten here, it didn't. It wasn't a straight line. I had actually um, been very interested in being an architect a long time ago. Back in college, I thought I was going to be an architect, maybe an urban planner, maybe even an environmental scientist. I wasn't quite sure. I did like business, so I did study business also as a secondary major, but uh, I figured it was always going to be a fallback. I started working for the government early on right out of college and realized that I really wanted to be an entrepreneur. So I went to job fairs, and one of the companies that stuck out was this financial planning outfit. And lo and behold, I decided to go for it. So I joined financial planning and realized that was a life insurance agent. (laughs) And, uh, and learned that side of the business and eventually got into financial planning and asset management and uh, kind of the rest is history. Um, and it's a business I loved. You know, I, for most of us that have stayed in this business, you realize if you can survive the early times, the early years, you realize you do have the opportunity to help people. So for me, the big, the big why was, was not so much the monetary potential, which was really, it was really actually having time. Uh, and this concept, I saw that a lot of people in our business had created a great lifestyle. They could do the kinds of things they want. They were there for their kids' sports. They were there for dinner. And so that was appealing to me, uh, to, con- to control the destiny um, and make enough money to be what we'll call comfortable, but have that balance. I had that real early on. I had a big mind for this. For this. Yeah. Yeah. Same. I was drawn to it. I was drawn to the industry. It looks like you and I kind of fell into it the same direction. We kind of got uh, uh, nabbed into the finan- or to the life insurance industry, and thinking we were financial advisors and planners. Which you know there are many, and I have mm-hmm. several clients who are financial advisors, financial planners inside that realm. Um, but mind I ask, what company did you begin with? So I started with I started with Equitable. In fact, I still have an affiliation okay. in some measure with with Equitable. It's changed names a couple of times. Locally, it was a company called Carbarth, and they were fantastic. I and mean, they they were just light years ahead in terms of doing planning uh, before product. So they gave me a great opportunity. And interestingly enough, my firm is actually still there today. Although I'm no longer a managing partner, uh, the firm still exists and really acts independently. Uh, we've they've allowed us to build what we wanted to build and brand our own thing. So it was a fantastic outlet for us um, and still, you know, great supporters today. That's great. Yeah. I found my experience at Northwestern was kind of like how um, accountants start off and they go to the, you know, one of the big four, maybe it's the big three now <laughs> where they just get all this experience. And that, that was really invaluable. So good. Uh, um, I, you know, we, we have discussions sometimes about fee only, fee based, commission only, and there are pros and cons to each. And that's not the point of this podcast, but it's it's fun to hear where we started from mm-hmm. and how we got here. Um, and and I hear this one a lot of kind of being being um, recruited to to be in the industry through life insurance based companies and really loving that planning. So from there, where did you, where did you go? Did you end up going independent? Did you start your own RIA? What did you do? Yeah. Well, we did actually, uh, we did uh, start an RIA uh, actually within our organization 
Um, and we've done pretty much everything. I say we were 25 people, half our advisors, half our staff, and uh, all in the Philadelphia region. Each of us focused on a different discipline. I wanted to focus on financial planning. Um, and I think it's really interesting, though. That I do notice a difference today in this space. We believe, and as you know, one of our good friends, Derek Notman, and I are, are, are speaking a lot these days about leading with advice, right? This, there's a most customers don't want to buy, right? They, they, I'm sorry, they don't want to be sold. They want to buy and they want to be engaged. And that means you got to start with advice. The interesting thing about the life insurance business mm -hmm. is that it did teach us one thing that was really strong, which was fact finding first and uncovering the real challenges and problems, right? Protect the family first before you go, go crazy and you know try to invest your $13 in a stock fund that you're going to try to explode, right? And so it did teach us to start with fact finding. I noticed there's a lot of advisors out there that have this uh, idea that sales is a bad word, but it, it's not. that's not the truth. It doesn't matter whether you are a salesperson who advises or an advisor who sells. Ultimately, learning how to deliver advice to people and engage them and then help them implement is really critical. We, 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 I think, unfortunately, get too stuck in this idea, idealistically, that we have to just provide all this great advice. But if we don't help them execute, I don't know if we've served them. I see plenty of people driving around texting without the seatbelts on. And I'm wondering, you know, if their parents saw them, would they let them get away with that? No, we have to help people take action, mm -hmm. even when it's uncomfortable, um, because they're, you know, they're not actually being holistic. And that's the big thing, isn't it, Travis? How do you help people be holistic? That's the balance yeah, of advice. Is. I agree with you. And that, and that's a really good point that as you got into the life insurance industry, the fact finding piece was really what I, made me love the planning industry. Mm -hmm. It's like, I love being able to interview people. I mean, we're both interviewers now, right? You have, yeah. you're, you're, you interview people all the time and I'm interviewing this podcast. You've been on lots of podcasts. It's a fun thing to do to learn about what people's goals and, and dreams are and then help them to accomplish it. And, you know, I had a good mentor who said, it's not sales, um, it's persuasion. You're persuading mm -hmm. people to follow the advice you give them. Doctors do this all the time. They just put on a white coat and they have a process, but we don't call it, you know, medical sales, <laughs> but it is, it's a medical sale industry, right? You don't go to the doctor to think you're getting sold medication, but you are like, you're yeah. being persuaded to do something. So that's a great topic. And I, and I love that. And I love that it's, uh, you know, as you're talking about that balanced holistic approach, um, sounds like, you know, you're able to really latch on to, and that's helped to drive your career. So let's, let's talk about, you know, as you're able to build this business, you're able to then expand into asset map and, and to, you know, basically help advisors. Now we'll, we'll talk more about how that works mm -hmm. later. What, what is your definition of balance? That's a good question. I think someone told me a long time ago that balance achieving balance was like trying to stand on a ball right? There are moments of balance. So I say that to you because this is obviously an incredible core expertise of yourself and your book is awesome. Thanks for sharing that with the planet. Oh, um, the, I came at it from the standpoint that I didn't have to achieve perfection in the balance, but I had to make an attempt as to what the definition of that meant in my own personal life. For me, when I was in my thirties, I'm now in my late forties, my goal with the business when I saw people creating a certain lifestyle was not to make a gazillion dollars. It was to literally work 20 hours a week. That was my goal, to work 20 hours a week, spend a month in the winter at the mountains skiing with my whole family, and a month in Europe. I don't know why I came up with this idea. And if I could do that and basically be home at every dinner and walk my kid to school, take my kid to school, that would be balanced and have enough money that I didn't have to, that I had more than my mortgage and my cost of food. Right? I didn't feel like I had to make them. Um, and because I defined that specifically, that that was going to mean balance to me if I achieved that. It didn't matter how hard I worked during those 20 hours. Well, by the time I was 32, I got to that place. And of course, I what do I do with all this extra time? <laughs> And I found actually that what that definition of balance for me wasn't actually the definition of what I wanted when I finally arrived there. What I found is that the critical elements that were really valuable to me was that I was home at five o'clock every day, no matter what, no matter what. 
um, nothing would, uh, would I, I literally will get up and walk out of a meeting if I know that it's going to make me late for 5, 5.30 now. That I definitely taking my kid to school every single morning. And I, we, we live in a place where I moved my office and my house next to the school so I can do that. Like a walk. Those were the elements of lifestyle balance that I wanted to be essential. And everything in my life supports it, including my chief of staff. He, he knew that literally to keep me honest, he, he knew that that was my number one priority. Don't get me wrong. I work now probably 80 hours a week because I love it. And I can't, I, I, I'm a worker. <laughs> I find I get bored after about a day of vacation. So, um, so I think for me, balance is recognizing how do I create enough passion around what I do and how do I offload as much of the work that I don't love as possible. And that's been a real key for my, both my financial practice and now the technology company as a CEO is, is really putting in processes for things that I that don't serve me from a balanced perspective or don't keep me balanced, I'll say emotionally and mentally, uh, and also getting rid of those things that are really am not my core competency because those upset my balance in a sense. You can, can you imagine that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're definitely a, a very smart, wise person who knows these are the things that I don't want to be doing. You offload those to others and you try to stay focused on your number one priority you know, I, I know you have a copy of the book, but really the definition of balance for most people that I've interviewed is it's doing those things that matter the most to them. And when they're doing that, they feel balanced. It's more of a feeling than anything mm-hmm. else that I've noticed as I've interviewed over 150 advisors. So that's, it's, it's really great. You know, our, our definitions line up, which that's fantastic. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't on, on this mm-hmm. uh, show, but as you've, been in the industry, you've been there as an advisor, and now as an advisor to advisors, mm. you've rubbed shoulders with probably what hundreds, thousands of other advisors out there in the industry. Easily. What what have you seen as some of the biggest issues for other advisors um, who are trying to to achieve this balance? Well, I think you you talk about this plenty, which is I don't think people are asking themselves the question: what is what does balance mean for them? Um, I think it's a challenge when you don't, you don't even know what you want. You, you can't even, you know, fall into it. Um, uh, maybe you get lucky, I guess. For advisors that I talk to, I, I have this um, big focus on the following word, intentionality, right? Now, I think this, this parlays into a lot of what I think we both are, are caring about. We're finding that out as we talk about it, right? Um, intentionality with respect to what? where you're going to spend your time, who you're going to work with, what clients you want, how do you want to feel when you work with those clients, which clients deserve to work with you, which ones probably should move on. Um, How do you manage your time and your process when you deliver advice? uh, Is this, does this, uh, does it allow the client to get to balance? I mean, when you think about as a professional provider of services, in this case, financial services, most of the time when a customer comes to an advisor, they probably have some sense of imbalance. Something's out of control. They don't understand it. They know their investments, but their insurances are a mess. They got their tax thing down right, but their legal situations are a cluttered. Um, and so usually what happens is there's a catalyst, either an experience or an awareness that happens where now the customer is trying to, you know, get okay, right? They're trying to be healed in some regard, or they want some insight as to whether they're okay. And I think that's the real big thing that advisors need to deliver today. It's not just about whether your product's the best or the least expensive or the highest performing um, or illustrates the best, whatever it is. Um, It is really, are you giving people a sense of certainty, which arguably is a sense of balance as you've defined it? Um. And, uh, and so that's what, I, that's what I tend to be talking about more these days, which is how do I help other people get certainty, clarity through my intentionality about helping them fix what's awry in their life? We use Asset Map to do that. So that's really why one of the reasons why we designed it is because we wanted to force the conversation of imbalance. Look at this. This is totally out of whack. Why do we have this here? Should we move this here? Let's, let's get this all organized so that when you look at this piece of art, it actually delivers harmony to you. It's intentional. So um, 
it's very much actually aligned in, in the big why of why we, uh, why we designed it in the first place. And that's what I talk about. I love that. Love that. I mean, you created tech to help fix the balance problem in the industry. It's probably why we're so closely aligned and I get to rub shoulders with you as often as we do cool. is that we're, you know, definitely kindred brothers on this. Um, tell me what have you seen advisors really struggle with this? Cause a lot get into this industry for exactly what you met, you mentioned flexibility, mm -hmm. lifestyle choice, you know, being able to manage your own time. Um, do you see them get caught up in what I call the workaholic trap where they got into the industry for the right reasons and get started and they get caught up because they don't have processes. They don't have time management systems. They don't have boundaries and they end up, you know, basically slaving away at something they no longer love. I see, I see both sides of this one here. Here's one take that I would offer to you. I, and you know, for those of you listening, I'm sure you can relate to this. We start out in this business working frenetically to make sure that we can make ends meet. It means prospecting. It means networking. It means doing the things that we do to build the business. And that's like any entrepreneur, right? You just, you work it's cause it's yours. You, it's your ownership. It's your reputation. You got to build it. And if you're successful enough to stick it in this business, we, we do know that there's a very high uh, turnover rate in financial services in the early years, right? Unless you have some mentorship or you have maybe family in the business or someone gives you a book of business, it's challenging to get there. You learn the skills that it takes to keep growing your business and sometimes those skills become the definition of why you show up every day. In fact, you feel like you have to keep running at that pace or else it's going to all fall apart. I've seen plenty of advisors who you know, believe that doing what they always did will get them what they always got. Um, there is a moment, I think, of awareness that we tend to have when usually advisors get overwhelmed. And that's the moment, the catalyst for when they decide something has to change or they or you know, either health is going to change, right? Or they're going to lose people in their family because <laughs> they're not around or they're just going to go crazy. And they're going to give up with this crazy business, right? Because there's a lot of no's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of negativity, there's a lot of anxiety in our business. Think about the markets, uh, think about uh, reputation, uh, think about people who are not happy and you don't know why you think you gave them your heart and soul and they complain about something. What? Um, so there's a lot resting on your shoulder. So we can, I can understand and empathize with a lot of us in the business who go through this, but there, there tends to be a catalyst, Travis, that, that drives us to recognize, okay, I need to make a change. Often, if that change is powerful enough, it will force us to go get coaching or start listening maybe to podcasts or reading, uh, doing what we need to do to start getting more aware. Uh, and awareness is really critical to this. Um, and then it's when, what do they learn? They learn that they need to offload uh, a certain number of clients. They need to focus on 80-20. There's a hundred reasons that we all know to do it, but we don't always do what we know. Um, so that, that's what we tend to see um, helping advisors get into the moment early. I was blessed enough to have mentors in my, in my practice that taught me this stuff at such an early age. And I didn't, of course, like most children, right? You, you, know, you know, I know why my parents told me not to cross the road without looking. I didn't really understand why it was valuable because nobody was ever coming down the road until the moment when you're a parent too, and you tell your kids the same thing. Um, there's a, so getting insight to that, those kind of best practices early on didn't require me to get to frenzy. I knew very early on that I should only keep X clients. And that means once somebody overfilled the bucket, I've got to let somebody go. And getting into those habits, as you can imagine, those best practices early um, enabled me to, at the age of 35, work literally 20 hours a week and make three times more than I ever thought I would make. Um, and say, okay, I'm going to start a tech company. I'm going to fund it myself. And I'm going to do it only the way I want to do it. It's, and I'm not going to have any other bosses. Um, and by the way, that was a very expensive project. That There was no balance in that. <laughs> there was no balance. I don't know if I'd recommend that one again. Um, it's been extraordinary, just like just like parenting. It's, it's an interesting journey and you would never change it looking back. Um, I don't know that I'd recommend starting a tech company when you have a thriving practice. Um, Definitely, you have to make choices. So, I think the the culmination of all that rant is what um, you know. How do you help advisors um, deal with the issue of making intentional decisions now that set you up 
for arriving at a place where you can have some sense of balance or at least what you're looking for. Right. Don't wait. Don't wait. Yeah. I love that. Cause exactly what you were talking about there, there is an incredibly high turnover rate in this industry very early on. And I always called it the daddy and the business factor. Like if you had a daddy in the business, like you made it and no offense, anybody that has, yeah, you know, some a relative in the business, like you mentioned it, like it was just a, you were a leg up and you could get their B or even C clients and do probably better than most people in, who started from scratch. Like I was a scratch agent. I mm-hmm. didn't have anybody. So. I didn't want to go to friends and family. I contacted them and said, Hey guys, I'm doing this, but I actually just went out and created my own network of people. And that served me really well. Um, but I saw a lot of people come in and leave and they left quick um, yeah. to the point where I thought, man, I wonder if this was by design. <laughs> and I started to wonder if this was by design so that there became this pool of orphan clients that could feed you know, management. And anyway, I, maybe some business models operate that way. I don't think that was really what was happening, but it, I questioned it a lot. And I was like, man, what do I need to do? I did exactly what you said. I got coaching. I read, I went to seminars, bought, bought everything I could to try to figure out this problem. And then that's what brought me here to this podcast now speaking, you know, and, and everything else I do for advisors. And interestingly enough, like you and I are following these parallel paths, you know, you end up in tech and end up in coaching, but we're trying to help people, you know, solve these problems. Um, but I like what you said about um, awareness because there is something that researchers have found called the five stages of change. Mm. And they found that um, w- when it comes to smoking cessation programs, that um, why would people not go along the process and change and, and be done smoking if they wanted to? And they followed them and found, well, yeah, it's because some people, they're, they're like pre-awareness and they get to this point where like, oh yeah, I am aware, but uh, I don't necessarily want to change. And oh yeah, okay, I want to change. I should try. And they get to the action phase where they try and they find out this is so addictive and hard. Wow. To the point where they get through the program and then it's, wow, I used to smoke. Now look at me now. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've applied that and it's been applied to this industry, to financial counseling, financial planning. And you, you are exactly right. But when do we actually apply that to the advisor? Practice management, the five stages of change applied to, you know, practice management in this industry, because there's really one area of this industry that you don't get CE for. It's practice management. <laughs> uh, Notice that? That's interesting. Does so, that, you think that's because yeah. the industry doesn't value practice management, but they they manage best interest advice and being competent? I, 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 that's, how is that any different than the fact that we give no financial education to our entire population or don't teach them how to parent? I, it's the, you're exactly. right. The, the same, uh, we can get into probably a whole podcast on that one. Um, yep. It is a good, it's a really good question. I hadn't thought about it. Um, in the context of why, as an industry, we don't create competency around the thing that actually causes us the greatest pains in most cases, how do you manage your practice, and also has the greatest potential to create the wealth and success if you run it right. Um, having purchased and now uh, you know exited a practice, um, it makes a big difference in terms of how how that outcome works if you're prepared, if you're intentional, if you have thought of a lot of things ahead of time. Um, so it makes all the sense in the world to create as much systems and process as you can to, to create that, you know, that uh, security during life as well as um, after, you're, after you're no longer here. I, I think there's, um, there's an area that I think advisors are missing. And I didn't get this really. I knew it. I knew it intellectually. I didn't, I didn't know it until I really experienced it. Know it, like truly know it. And I don't know if you've read the book Traction. Have you read the book Traction by, by uh, Wickman? It I've became, heard of it. Yeah, it, it needs to be on my list. It became, it's, a, it's basically around this concept of um, uh, operating. It's an operating system for how you run your practice. Uh, very you know, technical, how you run a meeting and so forth. But um, one of the things that it said to me that resounded Uh, was this idea that very often advisors tend to be the outgoing visionary communicator type of personality 
But in order to really thrive as an entrepreneur, you need an, uh, an integrator. But for lack of a better word, is basically you need a right-hand person. You need a person who's going to execute on all the promises you make, who's organized, who tends to have that skill. And, and very often, if you look at some of the best companies, if you do a lot of reading, um, whether it's the books that are all on all our shelves, uh, I won't mention them all, you know, typically you have a two-party system, right? You have somebody who's executed at, at one thing and, and another person who's complimenting them. We also sometimes call these spouses. Um, <laughs> we sometimes call these business partners. Um, but the point is, is that having somebody who compliments your skills is really, is, I think has really been big for me. Now, I took on a chief of staff. I, I, was, um, I, was work, I started working with a lot of CEOs and public companies. And I kept noticing I'm interacting with their chief of staff all the time. I'm like, who is this chief of staff? Is this their assistant? No, they're an attorney. But, but I, So I started researching and I said, you know what? I need one of those. I need a chief of staff. And it took me a long time to find, it took me over a year and a half to find the right person. I did. And even you look today, um, he was an attorney, he was in a space that just, he wasn't growing the way he wanted to. And Ivy League was giving back to the community by doing nonprofit work and just had the right mentality, but a complete different set of skills. And the reason I say, tell you this story is because today, uh, you know, his name is Thomas. He literally runs my entire life. So, uh, and I, and it allows me to stay in the flow state as much as possible. So when I think about balance, I got balance like coming on my ears um, because I have so much freedom to really pursue the things I want to and have intellectual discussions and create products and serve and help lift people and just coach pro bono because I want to. Um, and getting to finding that person or persons in your world that can take off the work that doesn't give you that balance is, uh, is really critical. So my recommendation is everybody go find that person as soon as possible um, because you'll be surprised. Even if it costs you money out of your pocket, it is well worth it. it, it it'll come back to you tenfold. Um, so that's my, that's my thought. Yeah. It's funny because I was going to ask you, I was going to say, Adam, give us one thing that you think would be helpful to, you know, fix that issue. And you just went right into it. You know, that's, that's convenient of me to, to think that I was thinking of that, but I really did had that question. I was like, no, I want you to pontificate. And you, you great, gave a great answer, which interestingly enough, almost every single time on this podcast, people talk about delegation, talk mm -hmm. about trying to give up control to have that delegation power, but it's true. You need to find the things you love to do the most. I call this your sweet spot and then delegate automate or get rid of the others <laughs> as much as possible. Even if it is, well, I can't get rid of my CE. I understand. I can't get rid of compliance. Yeah, but you can hire most of that out, right? Just like your bookkeeping, you don't have to do everything. I remember when I was getting my commission statements and I went through line item by line item on QuickBooks without the internet, right? And just plugging all this into my program. Mm -hmm. It took forever. It's definitely made me a $15 an hour employee. And it, it can definitely kill your productivity. I know a, a, um, a millionaire who uh, just couldn't get over a $7 an hour task that he could hire up because he just, he liked doing it so much. Yeah. Uh, and so th those, those things that can really bog you down. So I appreciate that. Adam, in your own life, um, mm. as you've gone through this metamorphosis into where you're at now, um, you know, and you kind of touched on it like, uh, Travis, you know, this is what balance is and I, I'm okay working these many hours because I love it. What do you think has been maybe, uh, we'll start with this, one of the biggest problems that you faced with balance personally. Mm. And, you know, we'll get into maybe some strengths here in a second, but I'm just curious first, like, where do you think you struggled where you've, you know, not been able to hit that mark that, that you would desire? You know, it's funny, as I heard you thinking the question, I'm thinking to myself, I think doctor thinks I'm actually balanced. <laughs> the funny thing about perception of balance, which I actually reframe as centered personally, when I feel centered, I can handle anything. It doesn't mean that it's imbalanced for me from my technical work means that I have some sense of harmony or confidence that I can press through this challenge. And so I equate that to your version of balance. So where I have had the imbalance, probably where I continue, I won't say probably, I'll be honest with you. I have, I have 
continued imbalance, and especially coming through this pandemic, is not is is finding so much joy in what I'm doing in the work side that I have done it at the expense of not spending enough time with friends. I've not spent enough time cultivating some of the other things that I have said out loud are important to me, but I've not pursued them. So I haven't been ingenuous to my bigger purpose, whether it's spiritually or whether it's health wise, I've made little efforts, but I haven't, I haven't quite gotten myself to take action in some of these other areas. So the recognition for you and for obviously our listeners is, is that it's far from perfect, right? And it's not this panacea. It is a constant effort. Um, and there's times when I quite frankly, don't even want to think about it, right? I just want to watch Netflix, <laughs> All right? Um, I want to meet some other short-term need. Um, but I think the key is, like you said before, it's awareness that, you know, it's still sitting there, right? It's the elephant in the room. So I think for, for me, it's um, just being honest and authentic to myself about not listening to my own BS sometimes, like I got it all figured out. Um, and also asking for help. One of the good things that, uh, that I've gotten out of the people, kind of the three core people in my life that really, I think, enable me, my family life, business life, is they also hold me accountable to a great degree. Um, as much as I tend to be a leader out in front and, and making a, you know, <laughs> this is, being a leader, as you well know, is, is a, it's a, you got to put on that suit and that hat and that smile, and you got to go out there and you got to lead with, uh, lead with by example. Um, you know, obviously, even when it's not always easy, but when you come, when you kind of take off those clothes and you kind of sit down, you, you kind of, the people know the real you, um, hopefully they're in a position to hold you accountable. And that's really, it's important that we be able to listen to them and not also be defending our nonsense, right? Listen to that feedback with open ears of how we can grow and how we can support the people that we care about and love. And, and that's something that we actually do very often these days when we're running at the pace we're doing is to be open. We actually have that commitment amongst the three or four of us, my mother, my partner, and my, my chief of staff. We literally, they literally let me have it every day of what I could do better. <laughs> and I have to listen to it. Um, so my, my recommendation is, uh, you know, recognize that you don't have it all figured out. Of course, be open to listening. Um, to people who you care about, you listen to their feedback. They're saying something you probably need to hear. You said something there. It's crystal clear. And you mentioned this earlier about how your, your wife, your spouse, like she keeps you, you know, accountable. And that's actually, that's my whole secret sauce. That's why I did a PhD in family relations was to find out this couple relationship and why, why um, those people that I researched were more balanced when they had good, you know, marital relationships and the ones that are struggling, right? They, they struggle with it a lot. Um, but you, you mentioned that that's really the last part of my book that um, is out there achieving balance book.com, pick a copy up. And it's, it's really this idea that how, how do we allow those people that we love to help keep us accountable without cracking the whip per se, without going overboard um, prison guard experiment, you know, <laughs> psychology 101. Like, how do we allow them to do that while staying peers, by staying friends, by staying spouses, right? Um, and, you know, I, I meet people from all walks of life, wherever I speak, wherever I go, but it's true. Like, I can really pick out a crowd, those couples who are doing really well and know how to do this well. And we've modeled it. I've researched it and being able to, you know, spit this back out to the public, especially financial advisors. I honestly can't think of a better piece of advice, you know, to end on here on this conversation, Adam, than that. If they take nothing from this conversation, what you just said reaffirms this theory that uh, personal development is good, but couple development is even better. So thank you for that. I really appreciate that, man. Sure. Um, now, listen, you've, you've been very successful as an advisor. You have this program that you basically funded yourself, this, this tech company that you built. Mm. Um, no outside investors, right? This was you. No, now it does. Well, in the beginning, so it's just been 15 years right. in the making, but yeah. No, now there's, <laughs> now there's, it's, you know, there's institutional investors. There's people that are doing this all over the world. It's pretty crazy. 
Yeah, but you started it. I mean, I you were yeah. you were crunching, you know, you were pulling long hours, you're doing all these things, and I get it. The balance is not always there. Um, I like the analogy of standing on the ball. I think others have talked to me about that one too. Mm -hmm. But where you're at now, still uh, business success and how you how you are able to give your time to help other advisors be more balanced. Tell us a little bit about how asset map works and how that does help other advisors to be more balanced. Well, it's interesting. One of the things that I, I experienced, I was a, a, a customer of a tool for a startup and you know, we took a risk on them. Just like I know companies took risks on us over the last bunch of years, you know, are these guys going to make it? Um, one of the things that he did is he offered a 15 minute consultation with every one of his CEO subscribers. I'm just, well, that's interesting. I'm going to, all right, I'm going to see what happens. I'll take him up on it. And I got so connected to the product and the, because I talked to the CEO and I found, and I instituted the same thing. So I, every financial advisor who signs up for SMAP, we're talking over a hundred a month, gets an email from me at some point and says, find 15 minutes on my calendar. Here's a link. I create this space. And it's my favorite time of the week because I get to just talk to advisors and solve problems and say, hey, try this. Or, oh, you know what? This worked for me. And I also run this boot camp, which actually come coming up next week. Um, I run it four times a year for 25 advisors for two days of straight immersion with me talking about all the crazy stuff we've done and how to take practices to the next level. And that's a fun thing that I get to get back on top of all the, you know, exciting speaking I do. Um, but asset map, I think, you know, the real big meaning, I'll tell you about the mission. The, the mission is this. When household, when clients, when we start treating them like a household, not as an individual who buys a thing, a registration, a joint account, no, a life policy, what? That's not how I think about my family. I think of my family as myself, my kids, my mom, because I've got some financial independences there. I got business partners. I own several companies. I got trusts I set up. I got charities I'm involved in. That's my household. And that's when we talk about holistic, I think people have been missing it. Holistic means the whole household. It also doesn't just mean investments. It doesn't just mean insurance. It means investments and insurance and legal and tax. And one of the things I was trying to bust with this thing was how do I try to surmise everything that's going on in a household, a holistic household on one page or one screen in a way that they understood it and was still technically sound for me as a technician. And that's really what took years to create with ASIMAP. And, and you know, yes, now it's as a product and a service, it's, it's used by advisors literally around the world, but people overseas, uh, we have units, our team members are actually in Africa and, um, in all parts of the world at this point, which is really amazing to me. And the reason was because we wanted to build something that was agnostic to jurisdiction, to gender, to perspective, to culture, to language, to currency, that would work in every different environment of anyone who had a household <laughs> and people that were dependent upon them and had some kind of financial junk. All right. And that was really important to build that tool. I don't know if you saw recently, we just got uh, rank the highest rated financial planning software in the country, uh, the United States, where we are. Um, and yeah, that was a, that was an unbelievable awesome. testament. I think from advisors, thousands of advisors, you know, voted as such. Um, it's because we're changing the game and talking more about how do you elevate the human experience, not the technology experience. We got way too much tech already. I don't even know what to do with all this tech. How do you make me and my relationship evolve? How do, how do I have a better conversation with my clients about what really matters to them and how I can actually add value? When you do that, you get us to the pinnacle of where we add the most value as advisors. It's in that interaction and engagement. And so I think what we're, we're finding there, Travis, is that we've kind of broken into a new category, which is how do you have financial engagement with clients um, and how do you facilitate that faster than ever? Because we've all learned attention deficit disorder as a literally a way to survive these days um, from the bombardments that we have from every different direction. So the key is get intentional about the conversation, intentional about where you're spending your time, intentional about who's in your life, intentional about what you, what you care about, and intentional, of course, whether your clients are actually doing the right types of financial things that serve them and their whole household and the relationships that matter the most. And that's really, that's a big mission, and, but, um, but we're doing it and they're excited to, to have so many people part of that, that, uh, that journey. Love that. And I love that plug, how it really, you know, tech that can bring you together, you know, uh, improve your relationship and increase your balance. 
Um, you know, if advisors want to go and check out what it is Asset Map does, I'm sure they've heard about you. Um, mm-hmm. If they don't use you already, but where where can they go to get more information? They can go to Google. <laughs> <laughs> at this point they could just they've go already gone in yeah, yeah already i think Google. if you type in assetmap.com um you'll get us uh with a hyphen asset-map.com we'd love to talk to any advisors who are really interested in, in changing the game uh, or just accentuating what they're already doing and having a really cool and novel conversation it's a it's a great way to great way to do it these days i love it well thank you for your quick wit, your amazing answers, your example of being someone who's striving to achieve balance. We appreciate having you on the show today, Adam. And everybody, you know, please reach out to Adam, connect with him, um, you know, Google Asset Map and and check them out. Uh, please, they're fantastic people. Adam is, is, a, is a good friend and I appreciate you being on the show and, and connecting with us here today. And so uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Travis. And, uh, and thank you uh, to everybody who took the time to listen to us. And uh, hopefully we added value to your lives today.